Our scripture lesson this morning is taken from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. I will be reading from the New Revised Standard Version, which is slightly different than what's in your pew, but you can see the page number there is 1,235. Let us listen for the word of God this morning. Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? The lawyer answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was the neighbor? to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers. The lawyer said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. This is the word of the Lord. I came down here yesterday to see if I could stand behind the lectern like Tom did. I would be like this. I use this. If I stand here, I can't see the choir. So anyway. I usually turn to the lectionary when I'm selecting a text to preach on. The lectionary is that three-year cycle of suggested scriptures for every Sunday, and it covers most of the Bible, And many Protestant churches and Catholic churches use the lectionary on each Sunday. So when I found today's text, my heart kind of sank because I realized the gospel lesson was the story of the Good Samaritan. It is so familiar. We are so ready to reduce it or to kind of gloss over it and say, yeah, we get it. We get it. You don't have to say anything. But there's another reason my heart sank. Put this story against the backdrop of what's happening in many places around the world, but what's also happening here in our southern border. And you have a lot of tension already in the room. We have a lot of different opinions on how that should be taken care of. How do we be a Christ-like neighbor there? How can we be faithful as one body and hear what Christ is trying to teach us and still hang with one another as this gets worked out? I'll get to that a little bit later, but let's turn to our scripture first. The lawyer wanted to test Jesus That's what the the text says. This man was very well schooled in the law, and here comes this uncredentialed guy from Galilee 
who supposedly knows all the answers. But it seems like the lawyer's question is fairly earnest. What can I do to inherit eternal life? Isn't that an answer we all ask at some time? I remember a man I visited close to him dying, and that was the question he asked. Do you think I'll have eternal life? So we understand that. Well, Jesus asks him, what do you read there? And he cites the Torah by heart. He knows it. And Jesus gives him an A. He got it. That's right. But then he wants to justify himself. And that word justify means he wants to show himself righteous. And so he asks Jesus, who is my neighbor? In other words, where do the boundaries come? Where can I stop? This is who I should serve, these people. But instead of giving him an answer, as Jesus often did, he tells him a story. So he has to discover it for himself. Jesus says the priest came along by chance, and he saw the beaten man there, but he never bothered to cross the road and to see it to him. And before we judge this priest too highly, we need to remember this. Things get tough sometimes, don't they? <laughs> um, we need to remember that that road from Jerusalem to Jericho is 17 miles long. It is barren. It is uh, way out in nowhere. Um, and it has winding little curves to it. And there are many places where robbers could sit and take advantage of travelers, especially if they were traveling alone. One doesn't dawdle on roads like that. And also the priest, he was performing rituals in the temple, not every day, but he had to wait until his name was drawn by lot in order to perform those rituals. And you see, if his name got drawn by lot and he wasn't clean, he was unclean because he had touched bloody wounds, he wouldn't get to serve. And sometimes they had to wait almost a lifetime for that privilege. It just wasn't the best time for him to help the man. Haven't we all said that at some point? You know, it's just not the right time for me to do that. The Levite, you see, was a lay priest person. He was a person that took care of the duties in the sanctuary. He washed the vessels. He made sure it was clean. He was the lowest grade of religious leadership in the uh, Jewish tradition. If he touched the man, you see, he would have to forego his job because he would have to go through a cleansing, which means he would lose some of his wages, and he would have to wait a while until he could do the job again. So there was a risk in him doing it. He saw the man there, but he didn't cross over. Haven't we all said, no good works goes unpunished, right? At least the two men saw the man. I was reading in the Christian Century recently, and it talked about an experiment that they did at the University of Illinois. And they asked one group of people to watch another group that was going to be doing a task. And they were to count how many times that group did that task. So focus on that. Halfway through the experiment, they had a man in a gorilla suit walk through the scene. At the end of that experiment, 50% of the people did not see the gorilla man walking through the scene. It seems that what we prepared to focus on, you see, determines what we actually see. And the article said, we can and do miss hugely obvious realities when our attention is riveted onto something else. So maybe in our lifetime, we need to ask, what does our attention get riveted on that might not allow us to see people in off-road places that are hurting? 
the Samaritan also saw the man. Jesus said he not only saw him, but he came near to him. The Samaritan didn't pass by on the other side, but he crossed the road, and it seems he came over to kind of assess the situation. He took his time, not dismissing the man as a criminal statistic, but rather seeing that there was a need there, and he needed to look at it. Remember, it was as much of a nuisance for the Samaritan to stop it was for the two men who didn't stop. And we need to remember, and here Jesus takes this story into a turn, the Samaritans were hated by the Jews. Hated. If the beaten man was probably an Israelite, and we don't have any idea exactly what his ethnicity is, um, he would have been appalled to see a Sam Samaritan coming to help him at the, his time of need. Samaritans were considered scum. They were heretics. They intermarried with Galilean people, Gentiles, making them doubly unclean. Perhaps the equivalent of this would be like a Jew helping a German soldier during World War II or maybe a homosexual attending to the needs of a dying man who was a dyed-in-the-wool gay hater. That's the kind of tension that is here in this story. So we can't just pass that off. And Jesus says he came near him. And I'm wondering if that's a place that we could kind of plug into. He came near him not just to see hurting people from a distance, but to come near to them. It seems like so often we reduce a human situation to a label and then say it's not our problem, and we'll just kind of erase it. So when we see a person or a people in pain or distress, is Jesus asking us to come near them? and to find out their circumstances. The Samaritan apparently was able to identify with the man. He had to put aside all the slurs and all the hateful acts and all the spitting on him that had happened up to this point and instead take care of the man, the injured man with com compassion. He was moved with pity, Jesus says. The Samaritan actions were generous. He went way beyond what could even be expected of a fellow Jew. He bandaged wounds, having poured medicine on them. He walked his own donkey with the man on the back. He stayed with him overnight. It says he took care of him. Then he laid down two denarii, two days' worth of wages, on the counter with the promise that he'd come back and settle up the bill, whenever, whatever that would be. This parable, you see, is not just about helping someone. It's about helping even those that we don't agree with, those that we might see as times of our enemies. So Jesus confronts the lawyer's prejudice, and he confronts ours. He concludes with a question. Which of these was the neighbor? And do you notice that the lawyer cannot say the Samaritan? He said the one who showed mercy. Then Jesus has one more twist, and it is this. The neighbor is not somebody out there. The neighbor is meant to be the lawyer. You be the one. You be the neighbor to somebody else. You be moved with pity and respond to human need. You minister to all kinds of people, even if they are your enemies. You go and do likewise. See, this is why I wasn't sure about this parable. This is hard, really hard. 
here's how I've thought about the scripture this week in light of our immigrant situation, which is a very difficult situation, no doubt. Your thoughts may be very different from mine, and that is just fine. We're bound together by Christ's command to love our neighbor, and each of us has to work that out for ourselves. I don't have answers for the border situation, but I also do not want to go cold to the situation. I do not want to pass by human needs of people, especially of children. I cannot imagine fearing for my life in Tawas. I cannot imagine my son, my grandson, getting conscripted to sell drugs. I cannot imagine wanting a safe place for my kids and having them taken away. But let me also say this. I do not think that there is enough effort going on both sides of the aisle to try and work out this human situation. We have labeled it, and we have tended to not deal with it, and we pass it down the line. And blaming is like passing on by. All I'm saying is, yes, we argue for the law. We understand that. But let us never minimize the human pain and fear. We may not be able to help a lot in that situation, but then that should prompt us to show mercy closer to home. I read a story recently of a Palestinian family whose child had been shot by an Israeli soldier because their 12-year-old boy was playing with a toy gun. He died two days later. These devastated parents decided to donate his organ to Israeli children as a way to bridge the gap of hate. Six people received life-giving tissue from that boy, including a two-month-old infant. I believe that is the depth of love that Christ is asking us to learn as Christians, as followers. Barbara Brown Taylor is an Episcopal priest, and in preaching on this text, she says it better than I can. So love God, she said. Love a neighbor. Be a neighbor. And let us not complicate things by arguing all the time about specifics. You know what it means to do love, because sometime you have been on the receiving end of it. And remember that knowing the right answers doesn't change a single thing. If you want, to see, want the world to look differently the next time you go outside, then you do some love. So whatever road you travel on this week, I encourage you to see human need around you. Even if it means you have to go off-road to places you don't usually go, or deal with people you don't usually deal with. A neighbor, a family member, a person you've quarreled with, a people, a people from a different party, someone you don't agree with, writing your representative, whatever it is, I encourage all of us, one time this week, do love in a place you don't ordinarily go. And I will too, and perhaps then we all will know what abundant life and this eternal life looks like on this side of the grave. Let us pray. God, you ask a lot of us. We are timid. We have our opinions. We're not sure how to follow. But we do believe that 
we are yours, and we will learn. So help us along the way, we pray, even at times when we are off-road and need help. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.